In this FRQ practice video, we're going to answer questions about ATP hydrolysis, we're going to do some bar graphing, and we're going to analyze what happens in the electron transport chain. Are you ready for some AP Bio Review? Studying the secrets of past FRQs is a great way to prepare for this year's test. Another way is to go to learn-biology.com and to use our enhanced practice FRQs that'll give you personalized feedback on your responses and make you a great FRQ writer. I'll tell you more about those later. To investigate how increases in environmental temperatures affect the metabolism of certain organisms, researchers incubated liver cells from toads at different temperatures and measured two markers of metabolic activity, the rate of oxygen consumption and the rate of ATP synthesis, and you can see that in table number one. Question 2a, describe the role of water in ATP hydrolysis, pause the video, write out your own answer. When you're done, hit play. Here's the answer. In ATP hydrolysis, enzymes insert a water molecule between the last phosphate and the second phosphate, converting ATP to ADP and inorganic phosphate. Note that if you look at the scoring guide, you can say as little as water breaks down ATP. Here's some background about this question. What is hydrolysis? Hydrolysis means breaking apart with water. What happens is that an enzyme will take a water molecule and it will jam it in between the constituent monomers that make up a polymer. When that happens, that water molecule will be broken apart. Part of the water molecule will go into one monomer. Part of it will go into the other monomer. And the monomers will now be free. They won't be part of the polymer anymore. Note that hydrolysis is the opposite of dehydration synthesis, where a water molecule is removed from two different monomers. And in the process, those two monomers are jammed together, forming, in this case, a dimer, a two-unit molecule, or it can be at the end of a polymer. This is how polymers are built by dehydration synthesis. Why is that important? Because that might show up on the next FRQ. Now that we know about hydrolysis in general, let's apply that to ATP hydrolysis. ATP hydrolysis involves a water molecule being jammed in between this last third phosphate in ATP, the one that's between the third phosphate and the second one. ATP, of course, has three phosphates, one, two, three. That's why it's a denosine triphosphate. Jamming that water molecule breaks that last phosphate off and converts ATP into ADP. That's a highly exergonic reaction. That's the reaction that drives all work in cells. Note that the complementary reaction is a dehydration synthesis, where an enzyme will take ADP and phosphate and jam those two together. That's a highly endergonic reaction, and it requires energy from food during cellular respiration or energy from light during photosynthesis. And that converts ADP and phosphate into ATP. That's dehydration synthesis. Now on to question 2B, part 1. Using the template in the space provided for your response, construct a bar graph that represents the data shown in table 1 your graph should be appropriately plotted and labeled. Graphing data like this is a very important AP Bio skill. Let's do it. To orient yourself to the next move, I suggest you go back and you just reread this text from the intro where it says, to investigate how increases in environmental temperatures affect the metabolism of certain organisms. That tells you what this experiment is about. The scientists are manipulating the temperature over there, and they're seeing how it affects the oxygen consumption and ATP synthesis over here. That tells you how to set up your axes. Your independent variable goes on the x-axis. It's what you're testing. What these scientists are testing is the effect of temperature. So temperature goes on the x-axis. You have three temperatures, 20 degrees, 25 degrees, 30 degrees. You can set up this graph in multiple ways, but I'm just going to put 20 degrees over here, 
25 degrees over here and 30 degrees over here and I'm labeling it as temperature. That means that your oxygen consumption and ATP synthesis are going to be your dependent variables. They depend on the temperature. The dependent variable shows the effect of the independent variable. So we're going to label that. That's the rate in nanomoles per minutes per milligram of mitochondrial proteins. And how do you scale it? I'm looking over here on the table and I'm seeing that the biggest number is 22.1 and there's a range that goes 0.7 above and 0.7 below. So I see that the box that the College Board gave me has about 30 rows and that means that I can very simply set each row to be worth one point. So you've got two over here, four over here, six, all the way up to 24 and that's going to span all of the data that I need on my y-axis. There are other more sophisticated ways to do it, but that is a simple way that works and that's how we're going to set up our graph. Now we can plot our data and put in the error bars. So I'm looking at my first data point and that's 12.8. So there we are, 2, 4, 6, 8, 12, 12, 12.8, just below 13. And now I'm going to add my error bars. How do I do that? Well, I've got to go 2.2 above. So that's going to take me all the way to 15. And then I've got to go 2.2 below. So that's how I'm plotting my error bar for this first point. Now I'm going to plot my second thing, which is ATP synthesis. So that's 12.6 and it's got a plus and minus of 1.6. So I'm drawing my line, I'm adding error bars. And now I've got to distinguish between what is going to be oxygen consumption and what is ATP synthesis. I'm going to leave this bar blank, but I'm going to put little slashes in ATP synthesis. So now I've added a legend and now it's clear what bar refers to what variable. And now I'm going to draw for 25 degrees C and for 30 degrees C and I'm pretty much done. Note that you can graph these data in a variety of ways. The College Board provides examples of two in the scoring guide. That's where this image comes from. So in this on the left is different from what we did. What this student did is they clustered oxygen together and ATP synthesis together and because these are labeled down here then what you have to do is you have to provide a legend for the temperature which is what they did right over here a beautiful graph this is essentially what we did note that the scoring guide involves a couple of things you have to have drawn a bar graph you have to have correctly plotted and labeled your data and you have to have had error bars that's how you get full credit on a graph like this if you want to crush it on this year's AP Bio exam, then you're going to have to write great responses on the FRQ portion of the exam. It's half of your score. Where can you learn how to do that? On learn-biology.com with our enhanced practice FRQs. You read a prompt. You type in your response. We give you feedback telling you about your answer's strengths and weaknesses. If you need help, you can ask for a hint. If you're really stuck, you can study a sample answer. We have dozens of practice FRQs, and this is the kind of practice and feedback that'll lead you to crush it on this year's AP Bio exam. So here's your plan. Go to learn-biology.com, sign up, use our enhanced practice FRQs to get the practice you need to succeed. Question 2B, Part 2. Based on the data provided, determine the temperature in degree C at which the rate of oxygen consumption is different from the rate of oxygen consumption at 25 degrees C. Answer the question and then see my answer. You're trying to find which temperature is different from 25 degrees C over here. And they both look kind of different, but the answer is that it's different only at 30 degrees C. And here's why the justification was not required by the College Board, but you need to understand it. The difference between 25 degrees C and 20 degrees C is not statistically significant 
and that's because the error bars overlap. You could have figured that out just from the table, but it's very easy to see once you've drawn your graph. And just to be really clear about this, if the error bars are like this, that means that it's not a statistically significant difference. It's only statistically significant if there's no overlap between the error bars like this, like this, but not like this. You've got to remember that because there will almost surely be a question related to that on the next AP Bio exam. Question 2C, part 1. Based on the data in Table 1, describe the effect of temperature on the rate of ATP synthesis in liver cells from toads. Go ahead and answer the question, and then you can see my answer. Here's the answer. As the temperature rises, the rate of ATP synthesis rises. ATP synthesis are these lines with the hash bars in them, and we're looking at this, we're looking at this, and we're looking at this. And here's the important thing to note. There's no overlap in the error bars for ATP synthesis. At every 5 degree C increase, the increase is statistically significant. And you could tell that just by doing the math right over here, but it's easier to see once you've drawn the graph. Question 2C, part 2. Based on the data in Table 1, calculate the average amount of oxygen consumed in nanomoles for 10 milligrams of mitochondrial protein after 10 minutes at 25 degrees C. The answer is 1,650 nanomoles of oxygen. Here's an explanation of how I got that. The rate is 16.5 nanomoles per minute per milligram. You see that right in the table. I like to think of that as 16.5 nanomoles per one minute by one milligram. At that rate, 10 milligrams for 10 minutes would produce 10 milligrams times 10 minutes times 16.5 nanomoles per minute per milligram equals 1,650 nanomoles. You can also answer this question through some very straightforward dimensional analysis. You know that the rate is 16.5 nanomoles per minute per milligram. You have 10 milligrams for 10 minutes. So you're going to cross out milligrams. You're going to cross out minutes. You're going to multiply 16.5 times 10 times 10, and you wind up with the amount that you produce, which is 1,650 nanomoles. Another way to approach this problem. Question 2D, part 1. Oligomycin is a compound that can block the channel protein function of ATP synthase. Predict the effects of using oligomycin on the proton gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane. Justify your prediction. Let's start by getting oriented in relationship to the inner mitochondrial membrane and proton gradients. Here's the inner mitochondrial membrane. Here's the intermembrane space. Here's the outer membrane. And here it's represented in a much expanded diagrammatic form on the right. So what happens in the electron transport chain is that electron carriers like NADH and FADH2 bring electrons. They power an electron transport chain. That electron transport chain powers proton pumps, shown here at number three, that pump protons from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space. The protons accumulate in the intermembrane space, and then they diffuse out through the ATP synthase channel, shown here at six, and the kinetic energy of diffusing protons transforms ADP and inorganic phosphate into ATP. That in mind, knowing that oligomycin blocks the channel function of ATP synthase, can you predict the effects of oligomycin upon the proton gradient, and can you justify your prediction? So let's look again at this diagram. This is ATP synthase, so is this, so is this, so are all of these shapes. Oligomycin is going to block ATP synthase. What's that going to do? It's going to increase the gradient. Your justification explains why. The electron transport chain will still pump protons from the matrix over here into the intermembrane space, 
but oligomycin is going to block protons, prevent protons from diffusing back through the ATP synthase channel because they're all blocked. This will increase the concentration of protons in the intermembrane space. That means there'll be more over here and that will increase the gradient. I have a song about the electron transport chain. The mitochondrial electron transport chain uses electron energy for pump of protons from the mitochondrial matrix to the intermembrane space, increasing proton concentration in that place. The only way the protons can escape is through a channel and an enzyme ATP synthase. Which uses diffused protons, kinetic energy, to make ATP from ATP and P. Your number one move for massive FRQ success is to go to learn-biology.com. Take the time to work with our enhanced AP Bio practice FRQs with AI feedback. We have dozens of FRQs waiting for you. They will give you the feedback that you need to help you transform into a fabulous FRQ writer. Make sure you go to learn-biology.com and also please watch this next video.